hello everyone. As we speak, it's London EdTech Week in the UK. So to celebrate, we're putting out an episode of the EdTech podcast every day this week. You'll be hearing from a mixture of amazing teachers and educators, ministries of education, ed tech companies, sleep specialists, and much, much more recorded all over the world. If you enjoy listening, give us a shout out on Twitter at Podcast EdTech and share the London EdTech Week hashtag, hashtag EdTechWeekLDN. Normal service resumes next week. Enjoy! Okay, so we just finished a morning session, really some fantastic panel discussions and had our photograph taken with all of the 100 Summit attendees. And uh, I'm delighted to reconnect with Tra Mi. Is that pronounced correctly? Yes, that's right. Excellent. From Vietnam. And you're here with your organization, Kids Spy. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's right. So could you tell us a little bit, uh, you're one of the 100 innovations that 100 have selected and it's fantastic to speak to someone from Vietnam as well so can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do and what your experience has been like here as well. So Kids Spy was founded by Tad and from 2009 and like uh, I worked there from 2011 and I really like uh, the, the cause of that organization is really close to my heart. Like uh, they really want to support for the orphan children mm-hmm. to like uh, well prepare for their future after they live in the orphanages and wow. also help them to inspire for their desire for lifelong learning. Amazing. So, and uh, last year we officially launched a program called Maker Academy in that we set up the seven maker space in orphanages throughout Vietnam. Now, I think I've, I do think I remember uh, coming across this project, yes. So in terms of the volume of children that would be in an orphanage in, in Vietnam, is that like a substantial number? or uh, From 2009, it's like more than 100 children joining in the program. Mm-hmm. And in the Maker Academy program, like so far we have more than 300 orphan children joining in that program. Mm-hmm. And they join in every week. And what's the reason for the children being orphans? Is it a myriad of reasons? Is it a okay. lot of Okay, I will tell a story about folk. Like of he and his sister in a big flood, they can, were able to climb on the roof and they avoid a flash flood. And they, but they watched their mother was swept away to her death and they now live in an orphanage. And in Vietnam, we have about 1.5 million children like folk living in the orphanages. So 1.5 million children? Yep. Wow. That could be like a disaster, natural disaster, or could be like of their parents in prison, mm-hmm. or the mom can be a prostitute, mm-hmm. and or they, they like a the parents divorce and they have a new families and they just put the, the children into the orphanages and they do not take care for them. That's just like so awful to think about. And so the actual project that you work on, can you describe a little bit? So is it all kind of face-to-face and makerspace or is some of it online or how does that all work? Mm, okay, so, so like a, the traditional classroom in Vietnam, like a, you go to in the classroom and sit in, in rows and listen to the lecture and, and look at the teacher and just the mind wandering everywhere. And now you like a, this the space where the students come into the class and where three to four stations are set up and they have freely to choose which station do they would like to join on that. So like a, it could be robotics or coding or circuitry or like a, a creating something they really like to. And is it all years or is it early years? Yeah, it's for the whole school year, like of starting year, the September and we'll end in June. And from June to like uh, September, we prepare for curriculum for the whole year. And is it a supplement to the sort of normal mainstream school? or mm-hmm. So is it a club or is it something yeah, that they like would a, go? Yeah, after school program because they also go to the public school. and But they like uh, their school do not like good and to prepare for their future. Yeah. So they uh, we have that program for their children and they learn every weekend or the night at their free time. And each student will join one hour and a half per week. And given they may have experienced some trauma in their life, is there kind of extra care around, you know, their mental well-being or is there support for that side of things as well? Yeah, like it's just the, 
one-to-one -one discussion with the students like if they really like we build the relationship with the children but first so they can like believe into the teacher and so we have a good relationship because not all of them at the beginning have a good relationship with the teacher especially when in the environment they live in orphanage they do not believe in in many people so much but they can feel the the love and the care so they need time to to get acquainted with the teacher and they can feel that and they trust that and they will share what with the teacher and, and learning is better is this your first trip to Helsinki? Yeah, first that's trip right. to Finland. Yeah, how have you found that? How, <laughs> how have you about experienced the it? Yeah, uh, experience in in Hundra Summit. Yeah, and just coming here and. Uh, okay, so the first time I come in here is the first like a, like it's too dark, <laughs> and I wonder is it the morning or night. And because in Vietnam there are a lot of lights, yeah. and sunlight, and also, but I enjoy the fresh air mm -hmm. in here, and also like uh, this place, I can see a lot of other innovation, and it's really inspiring, and and have a lot of great things to learn from other people. They've hosted us very well, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. and maybe I, I can write something like hundred things I love about hundred. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> we should all like add one, and that would be yeah, that's a great idea. And then, so what's next for your organization? Are you looking for funding or how do you want to kind of expand what you're yeah, doing? Yeah, like uh, we've just received the funding for building one innovation lab, but we would love to receive more funding to can build another innovation lab in, in different orphanages. Currently, we built in one King Yang province. It's like a, a take a bus on to, from Ho Chi Minh City to there, like of six to eight hours. Wow. And we built that innovation and the students really excited with that and they really love the learning environments there. They like uh, they have a feeling that, that the classroom is for them and it's like really modern and the table and the chairs mobilize in the classroom and we can easily set up in the station they would like to choice and it ha also have a projector and two big screen and And who funds it currently? Like how's it currently funded? Ah, from Bill Storage, and Tad is the one who fundraise, the founder, and also they from the corporation. But we would love to seek in more about yeah. the foundation and other things can fundraise for us. Okay, amazing. To build so, more innovation for the other orphan children. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. If people want to find out more, what's is there a website they can go to? Okay, or? they can go to kissbyvietnam.org. Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. So, just had a fascinating conversation about potential for a new educational prize with John Katzman, who is now the CEO of Noodle Partners. So, welcome, John. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. And how's South by Southwest EDU going for you? Oh, very fun. Like, <laughs> this is my, my crowd, right? Like, is it, these are your all people? All of us know all of everybody yeah. else here. And it's totally fun to see everybody. So could you summarize our last 10-minute conversation? Because my own brain has been blown by it in terms of a new educational prize. And, you know, we have all these variety of prizes, whether it's the Yidam Prize, the X Prize, the Global Teacher Prize. So what was your idea? Well, as, as we were discussing years ago, I had lunch with Charles Murray, who wrote The Bell Curve and who's a big proponent of nature as the primary predictor of IQ, a primary driver of IQ. And we came up with the G prize, which was the prize to determine really once and for all the nature of intelligence. And the idea was that each participant, each team competing, would get a statistically reliable number of students. Let's call it a hundred six-year-olds who tested at a 90 IQ, which is about a standard deviation low lower than mean, and whose parents had agreed to let them participate in a six-year intensive educational exercise. So it could be residential, it could be tutoring, there could be psychoactive drugs involved, but, but in a very careful way. And the goal would be that six years later, your team, or at least two-thirds of them, would now test at the 75th percentile across a number of educational metrics academic metrics. So at that point, coming out of sixth grade, in that percentile, you're likely to go to college, you're likely to be a highly productive member of society. Whereas someone with an ID IQ, that's not what you would have predicted. 
And he agreed if that if, if any team could do it, and with whatever money, it doesn't matter how much money, if it's doable at all, it pretty much proves that nurture is way more important and that we can stop this talking about IQ. Mm-hmm. It further is a challenge to society because even if it costs a million or two to turn a student from from one thing to another, the return on investment for that money would still be significant. And hopefully we could get better and more efficient at it. But even if we couldn't, it would still be worth doing. So I haven't uh, convinced anybody to do that prize yet, but I'm really excited about the notion Okay. Of the prize. And I guess my counter was, what does that say about people with low IQs? And do we have a lack of empathy then if we sort of say, like, that they, they kind of are measured by that? But I suppose your whole point is that it's to see if they can improve on that and, you know, use what's around them to improve themselves, I suppose. Yeah, this isn't like you're born left-handed, right? This is a, a significant barrier to your life success. Mm-hmm. Um, the question is, if we can't do anything to help, there's one course of action for society in terms of how much we're willing to invest in you mm-hmm. and, uh, and how we see you. And if, and if it is something that's fixable. And by the way, if nobody does it in 2018, maybe they can do it in 2028, right? We're continuing to learn how the brain works and how plastic it is and how to affect it. Mm-hmm. But for now... At the point we can affect major change, now it's just a question of cost. How much are we willing to invest since we know how much of a difference it'll make in your life and how much of a difference it'll make in society if we simply invest? Very, very interesting. So I should let all the listeners know as well at the same time that we're here with Stefan Kasper, past podcast guest from the University of Southampton. So welcome. Hello. hello. <laughs> so what I wanted to do is, is really talk to you, John, and also Stefan, to get your perspective from a university sort of faculty member as well or staff member on uh, what you're up to. So you, you've obviously had huge success building and and launching to you and now you're working on Noodle Partners. So I just, I suppose... First of all, we could delve into what exactly it is you're doing now. And I'm sure some of the ideas that you have behind that prize have informed some of your educational businesses as well. Not really. (laughs) Um, I've I've spent an awful lot of time thinking about education, as is Stefan, and and there are any number of conversations. But but Noodle Partners has a very specific goal in its higher ed, and that is... I think we proved it to you and other people have proven as well that online education can be really good. That it is not solely the province of subprime educators. Now we have to prove that technology can lower the cost of higher ed while improving it. It's not enough to make higher ed better. The cost of higher ed is just too high. Uh, College going in the U.S. is down five years running, largely driven by cost. And so the point of Noodle Partners is I think, I think we can lower the cost of higher ed by about 25% without screwing it up. <laughs> it's really interesting because, I mean, yeah. w- w- one of my guests today was the University Innovation Alliance. And they were sort of talking about, you know, you, you've got kind of all these online service providers, but at the same time, you've got some of the, the premium universities just almost ratcheting their costs to, as a sort of status symbol as well. And, and kind of, I just wondered whether, you know, Stefan, you're from a university perspective. There's a massive discussion at uh, home in the UK at the moment about value for university, and our costs are going up, but they're nowhere near as astronomical as in the US. But you know, how do you see that playing out? Is it going to be more online courses or a blend of both? Yeah, it's really interesting because yeah, we're having that debate at, at home, and we're talking about the astronomical cost of a university. Uh, um, course and, and then when I come here <laughs> and it's my first time to South by Southwest and it's really fascinating to be here and, and really see things from uh, the perspective of the other side as it were and see the challenges and they're very similar but um, to a certain extent the uh, the scale is dwarfed uh, uh, you know at, at home by, by what's going on here and the wind as yes well. <laughs> the windy city um, yeah. 
Well, yeah, going back to online learning as well. So another presentation I saw here was on the sort of six-year evolution of MOOCs. Uh, he's looking back over the last six years. And some of the trends that Class Central identified was the shrinking of free dip in uh, peer-to-peer interaction so uh, you know courses are being recycled more often so there's less interactivity uh, among them among the, the course takers an increase in uni credits via MOOCs more online degrees by MOOCs and the last one was MOOCs at every price point so how does that kind of feed in a are you seeing that and b how is that feeding into what you're developing as well <laughs> I you know, MOOCs are a funny thing. Yeah. Um, the research by Gallup and others is that the critical factor of higher education, what predicts your life happiness and your uh, involvement and engagement with your job, is the quality of your interactions, the quality of your relationship with faculty. So taking faculty out of the equation is really destroying the village to save it. I think, I think MOOCs are a terrific thing, but they're not higher ed, right? They compete with textbooks. They compete with autodidactic tools. They're not higher ed. And so I, I see the world kind of branching into two. One, online programs that have the intent, the serious intent of being, of, of, of raising student faculty engagement, of being the same quality as we've come to expect from our best universities. And two is inexpensive programs that life learners can use. And we can call them anything. I guess we can call them higher ed, but they ain't it. Mm-hmm. Where does Noodle Partners fit in that as well? What, what, what would you term that? In, we're more in uh, the first group. I, I, I believe that, uh, think about the costs of faculty, right? If you've got a non-ladder, non-tenure track professor, Let's say he's making or she's making 80,000 US and teaching eight courses a year. So you're paying this person $10,000 to teach 25 students this course. That comes out to, check my math here, $400. Right? That's just not a critical part of the cost of higher ed. Never has been. So the notion that in trying to lower the cost of higher ed, that's where we need to attack, strikes me as perverse. I'm totally about high engagement programs that don't set the bar to the worst of what we do right now, but set the bar to the best. I agree with that. I think the the real challenge, though, is the the fact that we're we're not measuring quality as well as we could do in universities. And, and, And I think it's been interesting that MOOCs have lifted the lid a little bit on what that quality might be. So when you line them up uh, against each other, a lot of institutions are are very careful to say that uh, this isn't as good as what you're going to get if you if you turn up you know because we're we're investing this uh, you know our student money into uh, uh, big buildings and you know prestigious architecture uh, rather than um, well some some clever universities are going doing what they're doing to big buildings to online spaces but not everybody's doing that there's there's still a huge catch up so i do i do think quality is the is the key and I, i'd like to see you know, online uh, uh, challenge much more uh, in, in that way and, and actually give students a, a real choice. I, I agree totally with you, but I will say this. We, we're just completing a project that we're going to launch. It's U.S.-based, but I, I did a one-page income statement for every university in the U.S. And we worked with folks who built the Delta Cost Project and other projects in the U.S. to try to figure out where do we hire, where does higher ed spend its money and where does it get its money. But this is an income statement on a single residential student basis. So you can really look apples and apples. At a prestigious school, we might be spending between fifteen dollars and $25,000 per student on instruction. We're spending money on research, but we're getting research grants, which pretty much cover the expense, plus or minus a couple thousand dollars. We're spending money on nice buildings, but a lot of them, especially at private schools, were donations. And so if you look at what we're actually spending on maintenance and depreciation and amortization, it could be $5,000, and that's for a school that's been aggressive. The overwhelming part of what we're spending there is not on pretty buildings. 
It is on instruction. But that cost hasn't moved that much. People were worried, uh, Baumol and Bowen and others, about the productivity gains possible in teaching. And it doesn't mean that higher ed is, is always going to get more expensive. Higher ed has gotten more expensive, but not because of teaching. It's gotten more expensive because of support. You look at counseling and academic support costs, and they've gone up by between 100 and 200 percent in the U.S. in the past decade, and they're continuing to go up. That is what's driving tuition, and that's where we've got to really start thinking about how do we support students, whether they're 18-year-olds who are right out of school or adult learners. We've got to be able to support them better and less expensively. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's a holistic approach, really, to, to looking after that student. For us in the UK, that student experience is the be-all and end-all now. It really is. And they've got to have a, a great time from the moment they set foot in that institution right the way to the end. Because otherwise, uh, you know, as many institutions know, they'll, they'll turn around and bite you. And, not, and this is going to have huge repercussions for your future. So we've got to invest. and We've got to, to bring people together to, to support those students in, in you know, whatever uh, needs they, they have. But I, I do think that one of the big issues here is, is how we prioritise that and, and what, what areas are, are we looking at. And I, and I, I think, again, inst- instruction should, has, to be the, has to be the one. That has to be the top dollar ticket, really. That has to be where, where we put the money and, 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 and how, we, how do we differentiate our, ourselves. But increasingly, that's not happening. I can see that that experience is being identified in, in, in a, lots of different ways. So it is about the support that students are getting on the one hand. <laughs> well, welcome to Austin. <laughs> so yeah, I was just saying. So it's is the support that they're getting, you know, as a as a person. It was, you know, it's interesting what you were saying before about thinking about members of society and how their contribution. And uh, you know, we want students who are going to go out there and make the world a better place. That's everything. That's not just uh, about the learning. It's uh, about their confidence, about their skills, uh, 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 the whole package, as it were. And, and universities have, have just got to get better at doing that. Better is a funny word. And, uh, and if you think about it as something, the cost of that support is now higher than the cost of teaching at many schools uh, in the U.S. It could be better means we do less of it and, and force students to be a little bit more self-reliant. When you look at the MOOCs and when you look at other inexpensive programs, uh, things like Minerva, it's the reason that they're inexpensive is not because they've cut out faculty, it's because they've cut out all the support and they expect students to fend for themselves. They're seeing a very, you know, a, a, a motivated subset of students, although, you know, most MOOCs, you know, a, a, a tiny handful of people actually finish the course or finish the program, but they don't care. Here, we're asking serious tuition, we want people to finish, and yet, uh, coddling them is not necessarily supporting them. I know, and I, it's and a wider I, issue about mental well-being, isn't it? it? Is, and like really pressures, and yeah, who whose job is that to look after them? I mean, because if they're not, if you're not providing counselling services, next thing you'll be, you know, asked to uh, carry guns and, and do that as well. So, uh, you know, what else can we add on? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think this, this is the thing, and it, it's not, you know, it's still treated in in separate uh, bits, isn't it? It's still compartmentalised. You know, there's a, a team who looks after student welfare. There's a team that looks after the uh, education uh, needs. And, and, and together, they're supposed to encompass this whole thing that we call the student experience. But certainly from my experience in the UK, it's it's, it's very, very kind of... Uh, broken up and and then that we're, we're always falling back on this idea of kind of uh, you know independent learning and and, and uh, resilience you know that, that's a, a phrase that uh, comes up a lot well it's interesting because the panel i just moderated had the australian company so navitas ventures but navitas obviously have the the kind of prep schools for a lot of chinese students coming over who do their year intensive you know get your english up to speed kind of orientate yourself and then go off and do your degree and you know just thinking about whether there's a model there in terms of kind of understanding what it is to to be that student that can then go on and and perhaps doesn't need those services as as much but but there are a whole bunch of models yeah and to me the first step is to actually look at the numbers correctly and and break it apart in the case of students from East Asia coming to schools in the US or in here or in the UK or Australia a lot of times there are language issues the schools handle it, though, by charging additional fees, giving intensive language, 
and then mainstreaming, right? To some degree, it is a known number. It is put to the student, and then, you know, they're aware that this is a short-term project to get your English to where it needs to be to perform well here. And it could be that on some of the issues uh, in terms of well-being, we need to have a similar approach, but we can't even have the conversation if we don't know the numbers. Can I ask you both uh, where your greatest learnings were from in your lives? Uh, having said everything I've just said, I think all the informal learning that I've had over the years, that's always been, still been the, the most kind of uh, powerful. And yeah, I suppose it's the things you set for yourself. It's the um, challenges that you set and the things that you, you go after. And I'd like to think that you know, I, I had a, an education that gave me that, that grounding. But really, it's, it's absolutely that thing of learning how to learn, learning how to look after yourself. Most of the important things I've learned, I've learned at the wrong end of a two-by-four. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, it's not only negative things that teach you something. I mean, sometimes you try something and it works, and yeah. that's a lesson too. But um, I definitely learn by touch. So, yeah, not a, not a, probably not enough of that. I met a really interesting company here who was sort of, talking about you know tactile learning and, and I think you know some people really learn like that don't they and there's not enough of it perhaps so I have an interview it's now moved to tomorrow with uh, one of the policy leads for higher education from the office of EdTech and uh, obviously we just Bet- Betsy DeVos is walking around today so you know if you were able to tweak any kind of policies in the higher education space that you think we might need or would aid some of your objectives what would they be? Pretty much everything I have worked on both professionally and in my policy life or my philanthropic life, is about uh, choice. And, um, and so she's pretty attuned to that. But people think of choice as a competition, whereas I think of it, it's about fit. The notion that we can personalize learning by almost in the movie Brazil, you know, this, this massive bureaucracy that somehow cares about you enough to figure out what you want to learn, where you are, what you should learn, is ridiculous. The first cut of personalizing learning is choosing a school that's philosophically tuned to who you are. And the thought that one size fits all is so silly. Anybody with two kids, anybody with a brother or sister, like, knows that that's just ridiculous. And yet, somehow, we keep falling back to this very top-down mindset. And I don't just mean at a federal level in the UK or in the US. I mean even at a city level or a state level. Like, not everybody in Baltimore is the same any more than not everybody in... So how do you balance the two? Because personalizing to that very individual level, like you say, could be very costly. But then we don't want one size fits all. So where's the sweet spot? If you look at charter schools and independent schools and parochial schools, they are all about finding their audience and and saying we're we're just not for everybody. You know, if you're a math and science kind of school, if you're a school based in a a democracy prep, uh, a a terrific set of charter schools that are all about social justice and and political awareness, just as a starting point. I suppose in the UK, I mean, Stefan, you might have a thought on this, but I love that idea, but a lot of our humanity subjects are getting taken out you know even physical education we're just talking about being sort of tactile physical learning that's getting bumped out of the curriculum so like how do we you know is the idea of choice still out there oh it's really interesting because you you know your your first question of what i would you know challenge or change and and, uh you know for me uh evidence has got to uh be the thing that leads education not ideology and at the moment uh, uh, ideology is removing that personalization from education and absolutely it's the thing about that you were just saying about uh, uh, you know people uh, encouraging people's talents uh, helping them to be who, whoever they they want to be not processing them as, as it were not always being the, the same same thing and i think EdTech has a role to play in that, for instance. I think personalised learning can be a, a, a good journey, I think, for, for the, the learner. I, I see it more as that rather than t- to do with that, that person's uh, strengths or, or, or weaknesses. So I think uh, educators are always good at telling stories, and I think they're good at taking their, their learners on, on journeys, and they, they just need the freedom to do that without all the interference that, that goes with it at the moment. And then how about, so for Noodle, what's next? What's on your radar and what are you doing here this week? 
So the Noodle Companies is a studio. There are four separate operating companies. I run one that works with universities, and there are others. And, and each one has bitten off a big problem. Each, each one is a dog that's caught the car and is, and is working its way through uh, that. So to me, this is heads down, continuing to grow. Noodle Partners, we have relationships now with a dozen great American universities. We think we have our first UK university that we hope to announce soon. Can you, can you give us an inkling? I can't, but I can say that we'll have another dozen uh, this year. And that as we grow a network of universities, we're seeing some really interesting opportunities. Online higher ed, 75% of the students go to a school within 100 miles of home. It's not because they root for the football team, either kind of football. It's, it's that they're buying a job network, right? This is you know, the kind of industry I want to be in or the place I want to be in, and that's where, that's the theater. And, and if that's true, it means that the great majority of universities in the world are not your competitor, which means that they could be your ally. Mm -hmm. So how do schools network together to lower costs and raise quality and do so in a way that allows them to be more differentiated, not mixed schools, it's really interesting. That's it sort of very resonates entirely with the conversation I had with the University Innovation Alliance from the point of mixing up the entry of students into university as well, uh, and actually doing something about it. Yeah, I, I think I think that, that's true. I think it was really interesting. I moved from further education into higher education, and immediately I, I saw that it sort of opened up that collaboration, especially in the UK. And, and I feel like I'm part of a, a network of educators up and down the country, rather than just a sort of affiliated to to my local community. And I think there's a real strength in that. If I think if more institutions can can do that and try and solve the big challenges together, uh, then that, surely that's going to be a good thing. Fantastic. Well, finally, any books that you would like to share with our listeners, books, people, resources? We always uh, like to let our listeners have a few extra things to take away from the podcast. I think you've got three weeks to read Ready Player One before the movie comes out. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was, I was, I've seen it just walked past. There's a fantastic poster on the wall down there. It's really good. Great Austin is a fantastic place to be. I'm listening to the Di and Doug Belshaw's uh, podcast. I'm listening to is that on the, the plane. No. Yeah, Tide, yeah, the absolutely. Tide. How yeah. could I forget? Apologies. <laughs> and uh, Doug also has a really fantastic newsletter that uh, I would really encourage anybody to subscribe to. There's always some really good tips in there. Yeah, no, it's a great one. Well, thank you both so much from a windy Austin, and let's do this again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks, thank for you. Well, I'm really thrilled that I'm finally on the line with Dasha Moschetti, and Brant Steen, Executive Director and Associate VP of Technology and Innovation in CIO, effectively at Bucks County Community College, which is based just outside of Philadelphia. So welcome, Dasha and Brant. Thank you so much. Thank you. It would be great if you could describe to our listeners Bucks County Community College. So kind of scale of what you've been doing and how many college students you have, where you're based, what type of students attend. And then we can dig into how you're taking that ethos with the community college and sort of partnering and, and, and traveling internationally and, and doing your work elsewhere as well. Sure. Being a community college, we have both a credit arm and a non-credit arm, as is common community colleges. So I'll speak a little bit on the credit side and then, and then Dash will talk the non-credit side. Uh, on the credit side, we have right now approximately somewhere in the ballpark of 8,000 credit students. We have terms that run all year. We are in an area that's uh, largely landlocked by other community colleges. So part of our international initiatives have come from the need of wanting to expand, but not really being able to expand directly in our geographic area. There's sort of a handshake agreement between community colleges not to venture into one another's territory. Yeah, and as far as our kind of the non-credit or non-academic area, which is very interesting and very unique, we have over 75,000 students worldwide, which is really interesting if you think about it, because most colleges and universities are actually flip, uh, where they have a majority of 
you know, the students are academic or credit students, and then the rest and the few are the more like the non-academic um, continuing education, where we really are very top heavy on our worldwide and domestic um, continuing education non-academic students. We started about over 10 years ago with our public safety and fire training program and through Department of Defense contracts with the U.S. government, we were able to start doing some work over in Asia, and that has really expanded worldwide, uh, where actually we were just asked to do a direct contract with Oman, which is very interesting because typically we go through Department of Defense, and this was the first contract where it was directly from the government. And about a year and a half ago, our direct boss, Supervisor Jason Malin, Vice President here at Bucks County Community College, you know, had this idea of expanding globally since it's a little bit easier than domestically. And uh, we kind of took that and ran with it. And we had a connection over in Denmark. And that's kind of how it all happened. So we extended from the already global work we were doing into more of kind of the higher end business executive style training, a little bit different than public safety and fire training. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Very, very interesting. So, I mean, I guess when you're saying sort of non-academic, it's in terms of U- the UK audience, they would probably understand sort of adult education, further education, those kind yes. of terms. Non-degree seeking. Mm-hmm. And in the US or in the States, what's the kind of appetite for more vocational or technical training? Because Certainly here, there is plenty of discussion around that and, you know, making any type of learning more relevant for the world that learners will be going into. But I'm not sure that that always translates into policy changes or action on the ground. But I just wondered what, what, how, how you're seeing things over your side of the pond. Yeah, it's an interesting question. The general atmosphere for more vocational trainings is quite healthy in the state. Uh, particularly in in certain areas. Interestingly, I mean, you you hit the nail right on the head, kind of. The many community colleges get the reputation of being vocational schools or that their adult education tends to be on the vocational side. That's not entirely the case for us. We have certain vocational programs. We have certain workforce programs, welding and metalworking and things like that. We also do a lot of business trainings, as we were talking about earlier, a lot of public safety trainings. Uh, But overall in the States, quite a healthy environment for the vocational style. We've spoken with some community colleges, for example, that really blend their vocational training and their credit academic degree-seeking programs together so that folks might walk in the door working on a non-credit, non-degree, let's say, welding program that would then move them into a more credit degree-focused, you know, metalworking or some sort of industrial training or something like that. That doesn't tend to be our model here, but but it is quite a healthy appetite for it in general. And then when you described your work in Denmark, for example, and is my understanding correct that so that's less vocational or more about executive training? Could you enlighten me a little bit as to you know some of your work there? Sure, absolutely. So once again, it kind of happened, you know, with a conversation and a connection and a curiosity to see what else can we do. And the joke was here that it's easier to go over the pond than next door, right? Mm-hmm. That you know, we can't go into the county, the next county over, technically. It's really easy to, you know, go over into Europe and see what opportunities lie there. And that's kind of how it happened. And what was interesting is that we started with this idea that we were going to offer and really look into offering kind of more of the executive business style training, more face-to-face lectures, seminars. And we weren't really getting anywhere, right? We started realizing that that was not really as popular as we thought it was going to be. And we kind of had this moment where we actually just signed a contract on in December with a Danish company called Albatross Travel. And their need was to digitize their existing kind of information and education for their tour guides to get certified because right now, all over the world, if you're a tour guide, you, you can't be somewhere giving a tour unless you're certified and you can show local authority that you have a badge or a certificate or whatever. And as we started looking into this kind of more online education model, which we already offer here locally, we started talking to more and more companies and started realizing that 
most of Europe right now is going through this digitization phase where they have all this information, they have all this education, uh, they have onboarding processes, but nothing is actually digitized. And this is kind of where we hit the, kind of the nail on the head, where we started thinking that maybe this is the path we need to go in general abroad. Yeah. I mean, most of my colleagues will tell you that I, I'm not a big fan of uh, buzzwords and buzz phrases. They just kind of aggravate me. But <laughs> what we kind of stumbled into was this real need for, and I don't think they're really using the term yet, but they're, they're, they're making their way there, is this digital transformation idea and being able to train in particular their own employee bases. So particularly for global companies who have people all over the world, it's becoming quite expensive to keep their entire employee base trained up to speed, all that kind of stuff. And it turns out that in higher ed, we actually have all the perfect platforms to, to help them with this transition. And are you, I mean, are you partnering with existing higher education institutions or, or further education colleges on doing that? Are you finding that you're, you're able to kind of partner within the sector? We're not partnering on this piece with any particular other colleges, no. We're leaning heavily on the technology that we already have, yeah. just as by the nature of being a college, you know, we have obviously our, our online platforms for our online education, and we have digital badging capabilities and all these kinds of things. So we found all that really quite useful and to be really a, a big value add to these, these companies. And is that the platform that you mentioned, is that sort of proprietary or is it something that you've built in-house or is it something that you've kind of built in partnership with? companies? Uh, the platform itself is, is really a combination of products that we have either purchased or licensed, again, as just the nature of being in our business. Like we didn't go out and build a new online education platform. We're leaning on ones that exist, and the same thing with digital badging. And then we kind of combine those elements with the ability to register and bring students through a, a U.S. workflow of onboarding students. You kind of put it all together into a package that really seems very useful to these companies. It's things that they don't have, which is something we, we realized all of a sudden. You know, coming up through higher ed, it's kind of easy to forget, at least it was for, for me, that these companies don't necessarily have a great platform to yeah. train their employees online in particular. If you have a global company, they can maybe do onboarding for their employees at orientations and things like that and do webinars and stuff but they don't have a real platform for online education and can you give us some examples of some of the companies or company types that you're you're working with well what's interesting right now is actually uh we're we're speaking with a few uh consultants over um in scandinavia that already do this type of training they do face-to-face -face and they have a great client base and we just met with them actually uh two weeks ago but what they're experiencing as, you know, the people who are doing these face-to-face -face trainings is the same kind of roadblock is that these companies want the same thing, but online. So right now, the two big words are time and also flexibility. Employees want the flexibility that if they have to do a training, you know, it doesn't cut into family time. It doesn't cut into, you know, additional time where they have to do the work. You know, and the flexibility for an employer, you know, to have it available for the employee at any point as well. So a lot of these already existing business trainers or consultants, they're coming to an issue because they don't have these platforms either. So we're actually looking to partner directly with those who are already, you know, they have the content, they already do the training, and we're going to partner with them to help provide an online platform and work together to create this kind of online education Companies from medium size to larger, from airports to pharmaceutical to industrial. So they really vary. And it's pretty amazing to kind of see what the need is. And another big thing all over right now, and I'm sure you can agree, Sophie, that everyone's talking about, you know, the different generations that are in the workplace, the new generation, Gen Z, coming into the workplace you know, how companies are going to add additional technology or create, you know, additional kind of processes within the workplace to better these, all these existing generations. Yeah, that's one question I was going to ask, actually, is whether you're seeing any kind of trend across employer materials in terms of preparing 
workers in the age of artificial intelligence. So is there any anything that you could pick up on that that sort of reflects that changing nature of work as well? Well, once again, they're they're trying to figure out how to blend these generations. So the need is to have something, you know, take the content, put it online, but also make it user friendly for, you know, some of the older generations. So it needs to be kind of like a perfect blend, which once again, you know, for a higher education institution where we already do online education for all different generations and age groups, it is very user friendly. It is meant for all students, all different ages. Uh, so it's a really nice kind of combination. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of questions coming up. You mentioned artificial intelligence. A lot of that seems to be leaning into the analytics direction. So one of the other topics that we've been discussing in some of our seminars and whatnot over there is the topic of business analytics and kind of bringing complicated analytic topics to the executive level for, for kind of overview summary level statistics. And we've seen a lot of changes in AI there already, obviously. AI is a, a fast-moving and, and very new discipline for a lot of these companies, as it is for us, for, for that matter. From your point of view as well, how do you go about managing so 75,000 subscribers, essentially, or 75,000 users at any one point? Uh, so the 75,000 that we were talking about has more to do with our public safety area, which that's okay. more in-person, abroad training and, and whatnot, provided by the government. That's largely uh, managed in that realm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of our entire non-credit division. A, a large chunk of those are from our public safety area. And actually, majority of those, I mean, most of those are not online. We only have actually a few non-academic online courses. You know, most of those are on the academic side. So it's now interesting to see, you know, this need and this growth and kind of a addition to the non-credit area of additional kind of online education, which is really neat. However, what we are seeing there, and one of the things that our, our public safety area has been moving toward for maybe the last year or so, is that they've moved all of their credentialing for their public safety area online onto a digital credentialing platform. And that's a huge transition for them to move their subscriber base from paper certificates that they take to their firehouses, for example, and provide to their their fire chiefs as, as proof to this digital platform for that entire ecosystem of credentialing. So the digital credentialing stuff has really kind of taken us by storm here. We're working on incorporating it into our credit curriculum as well. So that's been a really big transition for us over the last, I'd say, year, maybe year and a half. For anyone listening in, who would you like to be partnering with more? Or like, what's the kind of what does the next six months have in store for you both? Well, you know, we, we would love to talk to anybody who is, you know, kind of where we are now. You know, those who are already providing maybe education, but they do it face-to-face -face lecture style and are interested in partnering with a school to see, you know, how we can maybe move forward and, you know, create more online um, education, online programs. But also, we're really interested in also um, speaking to those who are involved with different events and conferences because that's another um, kind of piece to all this. Um, I think I sent you the article, Sophie, about the event we just did. We uh, partnered with the American Chamber of Commerce of Denmark. We partnered with HP, Educause, and the event was wrapped around multi-generational workplace and also AR, VR, XR in the workplace. So that's another great example of, you know, kind of the path we're trying to take. Hey, interesting. Yeah, the multi-generational workplace, I, I like that idea because we're always talking about the generations coming into the workplace, but it's also hugely disruptive and there's this kind of hidden talent that's often not talked about as well, which just, just needs perhaps a different type of support. So I think that's an interesting way of focusing on things. In our exploratory phase of things, what we really bumped into was that there were two big topics of interest, at least at least in, in Denmark, if not uh, some of the other countries that we've been working with as well. And it's come down to topics surrounding Gen Z and the multi-generational workplace. That's one big area. The other big area has been business analytics and analytics in general. And so those have been things, areas we really focused on in our events and our trainings to this point. And can we expect you to be opening a sort of a satellite campus or office over here anytime soon? 
there's no current plans for that now. We're really excited for the opportunities. You know, it's it's pretty amazing to see, you know, a, a community college, which in the U.S., two-year institution, we don't offer four-year degrees. We help students, you know, graduate and, or transfer. It's really amazing to see, you know, if you really put your mind to it and you think outside the box and you kind of keep going to what's the next thing we can do, where you could be. End up talking to other institutions and talking to other colleagues domestically and even internationally is there's curiosity and interest in what we're doing. It's really neat to see that. Yeah, you know, I was talking to to someone about what I was doing, and they they thought it was amusing that the CIO at a community college was traveling abroad to help do business development. That I was just seemed very incongruous to that person. But the more I've thought about it, I've kind of gotten really hung up on the word community in community college at this point, and this idea that community can be much bigger, right? It's it's about a global community um, and the general globalization of, of really everything. And that's really become a turning point for me. Well, I, th- I think that's super interesting because, you know, perhaps the pushback against globalization is when people don't feel like they're engaged in that community at that sort of international level, where, but whereas if, you know, if perhaps it was more inclusive or people helps to broaden the idea of community just from that which is outside of your gates to you know whether it's online or kind of bringing people into the the, the, the global sense of the word perhaps we'd have well, less you know, trouble Sophie, with our, our mission as an educational institution is education once again when you think about it it's education domestic education abroad at the end of the day you know we're providing you know, a, a service that um, is part of our core mission as a, an institution. From your travels, were there any particular people that when you came back, you you know, it really resonated in terms of having an impact, having met them as well? Well, you know, it, it's been amazing to, you know, um, work with the American Chamber of Commerce over in Denmark. We're actually starting work with the American Chamber of Commerce in Norway as well. We're now moving mm-hmm. our Scandinavian, you know, work into further Scandinavia, but, you know, really meeting with a lot of the different, you know, executives from these companies have been very eye-opening and I I think really broadens, you know, who you are as an individual and also really gives you great ideas for what else you could be doing. And then if people are listening and, and would like to connect, what's the best way for them to go about that? We have a small web presence that we put together for this project in particular, but but really our main website, uh, you can reach out that way. We have we have many, many contact areas. Also, if anyone wants, wants to reach us directly, they can email us innovate at box.edu. That's a, a great place to to reach out. Probably the easiest way. So innovate at box.edu. Yeah, That's correct. Or our main website, which is uh, box.edu. B u c k s dot edu. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.